Welcome to our next episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. This is Bob Mosier, one of the many co-hosts you'll meet throughout this series. So friends, are you trying to learn more about the five moments of need? Maybe how to design for them, implement for them, measure them, and even sell them as an approach to your enterprise. Well, in the Performance Matters series, we will help you better understand the theory and best practices behind this powerful methodology. Okay, so friends, welcome back to another Performance Matters podcast. Bob Mosier here, one of your many co-hosts, and I can't tell you how excited I am about two things. Uh, The topic, which we really need to talk about after a uh, event I recently attended. And secondly, because of who's with me, I have two of the most remarkable colleagues that I'm fortunate enough to work with, the famous Dr. Conrad Goffertson. Con, welcome back. Good to have you here. Good to be back. (laughs) And then, friends, this one just rings our bell in ways that are amazing. We have been just, I've been fortunate for 20 some odd years to have known this person professionally and, and watch her work. And now we are fortunate enough to have her as a part of the group. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to Sarah Chisel. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to work with you both. It's just a dream come true for us. And here's why this is so wonderful, because on top of that, Sarah has a remarkable history in the topic, which is measurement. Sarah, you want to tell a little bit about your journey here? Would you be okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. So about 25 years ago-ish, I I pivoted to the learning and development space working for a technical training company called Productivity Point. And Mm -hmm. um, so that was my first foray into professional learning, understanding that, you know, companies actually pay for this kind of stuff. (laughs) And... (laughs) external providers and experts to to help them to, you know, train and develop their employees. And after a few years of doing that, I got a little bit frustrated because my largest account was Motorola Solutions. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the contract term, they came back to us and said, you know, first of all, what did we train in during this period? You know, give us some information about that. And secondly, what was the return on that investment. And we, well, first of all, we couldn't even provide them with accurate information globally on what we'd actually trained their people on because (laughs) the systems didn't talk to each other. But we really didn't have any way of um, measuring the impact, the effectiveness, and the return on that and that sizable investment. So it was about that time then that I joined a a colleague of mine named Kent Barnett, started a company called Knowledge Advisors, you know, with the desire of bringing some additional discipline to this space, helping to provide more information and data to companies so that they can understand, you know, are their programs moving the dial? And so that was that was my journey. So that's been about 18 years then in measurement and analytics for learning. Just spectacular and great work. Done work with you folks all on Admire Kent, the whole team there. And and we are really excited to have you here because now we move into the workflow. Now we move into performance. Sarah, why don't you share a couple of interesting stats? We're going to sort of frame this up with some areas and some things we've heard that frankly have been a little troubling lately. So why don't you give us a couple to start? Yeah, and I'm going to first just like totally indict myself and the work that I did or didn't do over the last 18 years with the first two, <laughs> with the first two data points. But I think it's important to understand where we are and and what the data about this space and and measurement in the learning and development space to to understand a little bit better, you know, where we have been able to move the dial as learning professionals within this space. Um, So I wanted to share a couple of things. The first is a data point from a McKinsey study. And the data point that jumped out to me is that learning leaders say that only 25% of their programs improve performance. And (laughs) that one, I remember the first time I, I read it and I was like, what are we doing? What are we doing? If absent of, you know, any information, instinctively our learning leaders are saying that our that our programs, three quarters of our programs aren't doing anything. What wow. are our stakeholders paying for? So so you've got that piece. And then the second data point was uh, from a follow-up study that the performative team did where they asked learning leaders a bunch of additional questions as well. And 97% 
of those polled, and I think it was a, a sample size of about 250, said that there was waste somewhere in their process, the learning process, but they had no idea where. So essentially, we were providing learning that wasn't netting an impact either to the individual's performance or to the organization in terms of organizational performance. So talent or business outcomes. And now that I've had the benefit of looking at this from the five moments lens, I cannot help but go back to the source. And that is how we think about supporting our learners at the t- at the time of their work and as they're performing and you know if you think about the first data point about three quarters of programs uh, not improving performance it's because we're not taking a performance lens mm-hmm. to the development of our of our programs the development of our solutions to our learners in the first place. So we're not designing for performance. So if we're not designing for performance, then we shouldn't be surprised when three quarters of our investments, programmatic investments don't net a result. And then secondly, to the piece about waste in the process, there's far too much of a disconnect between the actual work that's being done and where we're looking to try and support learners in doing their work. So of course there's gonna be waste in the process because the learning process is not happening while the work is is happening. So those two data points really jumped out at me within the context of workflow learning and the five moments because I think that both of them could be dramatically and positively impacted with the right design approach up front. Perfect. Con, yeah. what, do you, what do you think about when someone says, but, you know, Con, it's busy, it's hard. There's, there's just so many influencers out there after the training. My, my training could get lost in that. It's not a fair measure of my training because all the, their manager, the, the the learner's discipline, the the how soon they try to practice it when they get back, all those things are unfair to measure my training against because those influencers out there cloud the measure. So, yeah. so what what's your what's your answer to that, or what do you think that points to? Well, every time I hear that tells me that they're chasing a skunk down a hole. I mean, they're thinking about they're in a training mindset. They're certainly not thinking and designing and building and implementing around enabling effective job performance. Glory Geary saw this. I mean, what a remarkable visionary she she was. You know, in the 90s, when she wrote her book, Electronic Performance Support Systems, she she was very clear. She said, uh, in terms of indicting what was being done under the umbrella of training, that it wasn't leading to performance and uh, and that it needed to way back then. And what she saw was that you can't measure impact if you're trying to get there from the training impact because too much happens after the fact. By the time you measure learning, what's happened is they really, those learners have had to go to a lot of other things to get to where they need to be because the learning wasn't enough. That's the bottom line. Yeah. The learning was not enough to get them to productive performance. And so what do they do? They rely on other people. They they work through other systems. They do other kinds of things to get there. And what Gloria said is, look, if we build performance support system that supports people as they do their work. That system in the work in the workplace guiding them gives us the ability to gather data to make those direct connections. When I hear that, it just lets me know that goodness gracious, they're looking from training and they're the only way you get to productive performance is by going and involving other things. I shared a frustration of around what I heard recently, which is well then let's just back off this. You know, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of chasing the ROI thing. It's hard. I shared with you earlier, that's like a fireman saying, well, I just don't want to know if the fire's out because it's hard to sit around and, and dig in the rubble. It's hard to get into the into the dirt and the, and the, and the afterburn because it, it's messy. Yeah, but, a, a, but until we get to that level and understand that there's ambers there or, or going on, we don't go beyond just throwing water on the fire, which for training for so long has been just that. And so we see the flame go out. We assume the learner did well. They like the experience. They feel like they can apply it. And what was what they heard was relevant. So we pack up our trucks and leave. Right. But the the learners left with the mess of work and the reality of how messy and hard and volatile the workforce, the workplace is. And so we have to get beyond training stuff 
and training alone. I want to be careful. We don't we're not con- condemning training as an entity. We're just saying that for too long, it's been a safe place. And our only answer to what is a, a world we need to, to journey into a bit more. Con, talk a bit about this workflow thing and why it's been such a missing part of our analysis and our understanding for so long. Don't don't SMEs give us that. Don't they? <laughs> They, well, they talk, they, they tell us all it's important when we put them yeah, in a room. They could give it that if we ask the right questions, <laughs> right? We generally go into a, a task analysis or whatever the analysis that we're doing with a mindset that we're going to build a training solution, mm-hmm. not, not that we're going to enable effective performance on the job. You, mm-hmm. can't, you can't step into an analysis with a question on your mind, how are we going to enable effective job performance and not face the workflow? Because that's where performance occurs. Gloria Gary called it the performance zone, you know, the workflow. And so you have to face that. And therefore, the the measurable objectives when you're dealing with job performance, effective job performance, well, it's the ability to complete a job task whatever that is. And, and and we can measure that. We can gather data around that, you know, but we've got to we've got to be able to face it. And and you can't face that without stepping in the workflow and mapping it. Let me just say this, you know, Sarah, you mentioned waste. Consistently when we look at onboarding programs, we are and we step into the workflow and we build workflow solution, you know, that supports people as they move through the training, as they move through that transfer phase, as they move into and begin to sustain the performance in the flow of work, the the moments of apply, solve, and change. When we build that kind of a solution, goodness gracious, we see consistently the time to proficiency cut in half. I mean, we just saw a client take an 18-month time to proficiency down to five months because they focused on performance and they brought in the power of workflow learning. And they ended up with people being able to perform actually more effectively, more productively, with less oversight, all of those things they were able to measure and demonstrate because they were facing the workflow and designing and building and measuring around that. Sarah, when when you have learned more about this and you think about the world you came from, why does a digital coach and these kinds of things excite you? What does it add to a measurement conversation that we've not been able to have before? As you look at L&D wanting to get to KPIs, get to these things we've talked about for so long, why do you think it gives us a different level of impact and approach? Well, I mean, I think the first thing that's really important to remember is what we're what we're in service of as learning professionals within a, a corporation, within a company, within our organizations. We are in service of the business. We're in service of performance. And so what gets me excited about thinking about how we provide solutions that allow our learners to optimize their work while they are building their capabilities and their ability to do their work as effectively as possible. What gets me excited about that is that it really solves the measurement problem, right? Mm. The measures that we've been focusing on so far around you know, waste and scrap learning, misalignment, those are almost entirely assuaged when you actually have a digital coach sitting shoulder to shoulder Mm. with you in the workflow, right? Because I am, of course, naturally, whatever my work is, going to encounter a moment where I don't know how to do something. I'm struggling. And if I can get more quickly to the answer to that question and that support that I need, then I can I can get back to my work. It's then the ability for us to say, you know, the work stoppage was a matter of minutes versus, you know, other types of measures that I think we focus on, which are, well, we know from surveying our learners, you know, 60 or 90 days later, that they were only able to use 3% of the training from the class <laughs> back on the job. I mean, how is that useful and helpful right. to a company who is in a very competitive industry 
who's trying to, you know, improve their profit margins and their uh, overall competitiveness. So that's the exciting thing about it. The the data points that I sh- that I shared in the beginning, those should be a call to action yeah. that we need to be building our training differently. And instead, what we oftentimes translate those data points to mean is that, oh gosh, well, I need to find out you know, what's happening with my learners so that I can either improve the front end training or provide them some type of a job aid on the back end. No, what neither of those things is going to solve the issue. We need to to um, robustly support them while they're doing their work. Yeah, and that's what it, we have to take that from that. Lens. Anyone who can work assuaged into a, into an answer to a question is in a whole new world for me. That was that was <laughs> Stunning, Sarah. <laughs> love that. Love that. So let, let's talk about the case in point that I, I just want you guys to react. I heard recently. So, so one of those measures is confidence. Obviously, you know, my self-efficacy to feel that I can not just remember everything and so on, but have this the cognitive, metacognitive skills. There's my little word, Sarah, to assuage. And also at the same time, the tools, right? It's it's, it's a combination of both. It, it helps my ability to perform. So Recently, in a, in a more traditional analysis, a learning professional learned that practice builds confidence. Doing, right? So the solution, to your point, Sarah, to always go back to the front end and, and con be of a training mindset was, well, let's just build more practice in the class. <laughs> and then in the more practice that they do, I do agree, as opposed to 50 more PowerPoints, I'm all for that, right? Because because of the cognitive load and all that kind of thing. But that's confusing practice with true confidence building, because even after I leave having practiced a lot, I still just don't know. I'm entering the world of real, wor- real work. So con- run at this practice thing for me for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, years ago, we did some work for the world's largest manufacturer of pumps. It was a European-based company, and when they approached us, they said, when our people finish their training, their onboarding training, they are so confident. You know, they leave, we survey them, they're very confident. And even at six months, they are still confident. But something happens at a year. They just, all of a sudden, they, they say their training and onboarding experience was terrible, and they had no no real confidence in what we did for them. Can you explain why? And I said, well, it takes them a year to figure out that what you were doing for them didn't help them, you know, <laughs> it didn't help them at all. Al Bandura did the most salient body of research in terms of self-efficacy and confidence building as it relates to learning. And what he found was that the sooner that people perform effectively, actually perform effectively, and are able to recover if they make a mistake, that's how you build self-efficacy. Yes. Yes. Well, performing effectively in a controlled classroom is very different than performing effectively in the workflow. As you said the other day, Bob, the most powerful practice is work. You know, that that to me is a profound statement in of, of itself. Work, it's practice, it's applying, it's doing the work in the workflow. And when you the moment a person successfully performs on the job, that's when their confidence is reinforced and grows. So if we the sooner that we are able to enable effective performance in the flow of work, we begin to build that self-efficacy. The sooner people are able to recover when they make a mistake, we build that self-efficacy. And that's where engagement, employee engagement, is at the heart of that self-efficacy, according to Bandura. And that's where we've got to focus. Yeah, It's not about more practice in the classroom. It's about making sure that people, when they step into the workflow, they have the help that they need from a digital coach, GPSS, to perform effectively on the job. Well, if you want to practice anything, practice your digital coach. Yeah. I don't want you to leave because you did 10 practices on the same activity and you you got to the point where you think you can do it. What if I had you do 10 practices with, with a digital coach so that when you leave, you know where to find it? You know how to recover. Failure is a remarkable teacher, and it's going to happen in the workflow. What if I mitigate the time to remediate? If I can avoid failure by teaching the practices around using a digital coach while performing, 
so I do things correctly. That's where performance sure. improves, confidence is raised. And so it's confidence in my ability to troubleshoot and survive in the workflow, not confidence in my ability to have memorized well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and I'll give you an example. Um, so in in between a couple of tours of duty in the learning measurement space, I went to work for a one of the most well-renowned uh, business schools in the world that also had a practice to provide um, leadership development to corporations. And that was the, the business unit I was in. And I was immediately taking over a team and um, I had some, some things that I really needed to address with the team. But talking about this issue of confidence and coming into a role like that, you know, I remember going through my onboarding process and being quite stressed out <laughs> about my personal brand and my reputation. And, you know, am I going to be able to hang with these people who are pretty incredible leaders because we do world class leadership development at the time? This is what I'm thinking. And I'm like, you know, what if I met what if I mess up first performance conversation or the first time I have to give somebody some coaching? And, you know, I would have felt 100 percent more confident if I had come away from that onboarding with re curated resources and a digital coach that were aligned to the work that I was doing, because I, I had had experience in doing the work that I was being asked to do, but everything's a little bit different and I hadn't flexed certain muscles in a while. So that's, I, I think, where we need to think about the confidence uh, component and onboarding is a great example of that. We want mm -hmm. folks to feel confident coming out of onboarding, but we want them to feel confident because they know they're going to be well supported. Love that. And I think we confuse support with training or learning sometimes, meaning we don't think it's the same. I don't think a learner looks through the lens of this is a training asset or this is a performance asset. They look at it as a performance asset. And so if it helps me to perform and I learn while doing, that's training. Well, yeah, in, it in, is. In a way, right, Con? Mm -hmm. Gloria, Gary referred to that as unconscious learning. Every time that you're in the workflow, what she observed is when you're in the workflow and you're doing your job, you're learning. And if you have a, a tool to help you do that job, you are learning. It's not a conscious, I'm in right. a classroom. Right. She called it unconscious learning. But let's admit this. No matter how powerful and wonderful a training class is, when a person leaves that class, they are not competent. They are not proficient. They are they are ready to start. They're at the beginning stage of that. But expertise, experience, mm. expertise is developed over time with experience in the flow of work. And so if you want somebody who has expertise, it's not going to come from the classroom. It's going to come from a classroom into the workflow with experience over time. And that's the real learning. The real learning happens in transfer. The real learning happens in those <laughs> Uh, real world practice activities, Bob, that you mentioned of when people are doing their work. So let's change the narrative, guys, right? Let's if we want to measure performance, let's live at the point of performance. Let's not live weeks, days, months before only and try to correlate. Until we make this pivot, friends, until we understand the workflow through analysis, until we enable it with a digital coach, until we understand the architecture and design of the performance support pyramid, criticality, and all the things we've talked about in so many podcasts before, we're never going to get out into those higher levels of Kirkpatrick and Phillips. We can talk about them all we want, but we always go to the C-suite, and those are the businesses who demand these metrics, and they're going to poke and shoot holes in them. We know that and the exciting thing I like about what we do, you guys, and, the, and about these podcasts, clients we're blessed to work with and and folks like you, Sarah, we have on board is that we know that the that the future is now in this. And it's no longer something to talk about. It's no longer something to walk away from. Yes, it's hard, but it's doable. And Sarah, I love what you say. Sometimes I think we've made measurement harder than it really is. Right. I've heard you say that over and over and over again in the years that we've been together is that we complicate this partially because we don't understand the narrative. It gets simpler when you do when you understand it from this perspective. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that uh, Khan's been schooling me on and I've been so excited to incorporate now into some of our thinking of, around measurement 
is really the the partner to performance and productivity, which is the work stoppage piece. Mm. Uh, because so in the example that I gave you earlier, in absence of a digital coach, when I had that job change, what did I do? I made good friends with the <laughs> best other sales manager in that entire organization. And every time I needed something, I called him or I emailed him or texted him or slacked him or whatever and got my support through his coaching of me. I mean, that is incredibly costly, not only in terms of my own work stoppage, but my now causing his work stoppage. And ultimately, I ended up getting a lot of the answers that I needed. But at what cost? We can we can amplify performance. Uh, We can increase productivity dramatically without having that work stoppage. And so that's that's the important piece that I think is really the partner to productivity in the ROI conversation that I'm excited to have now. You know, the cost of stopping work to learn doubles the cost of learning per employee across the board. It just doubles that cost. And it's a real cost because people are stopping work. And so our goal, our objective is to enable and sustain measurable, effective job performance in a way that minimizes interruption of the work that employees are hired to do. And that requires us to step into the workflow and to support people in the workflow, which at the same time then enables us to be able to measure what is happening in that workflow and directly, directly demonstrate that what we're doing is making a difference in terms of people being able to perform effectively. You know, I don't think we can go any further than that. That summed it up perfectly. And this is why I'm finally excited about this conversation. (laughs) It's been the elephant in the room for my 40 years of doing this. And in the last 10 or 20 kind of working with you and getting into the into the workflow the way we can now, the narrative changes. We can do this, but we as an industry have to choose to change our deliverable, our approach and the conversation with the business and step up to wanting to do ROI not giving up on it. Friends, thank you so much. You're both spectacular. Great podcast, great conversations. Friends out there, keep it coming. Let us know what you think. We'll be back with another one soon. Sarah Khan, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Well, that's it for this episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. We look forward to future conversations around how to best put the five moments of need into practice. We welcome your feedback and can be reached on Twitter using my Twitter handle, at B-M-O-S-H, as well as our Five Moments of Need website, which is www.the5momentsofneed.com. We hope you're finding these helpful and will subscribe to future episodes. Have a great day, friends.